For over 25 years, E3 has been the central date in gaming's calendar. Once a year, the great houses of gaming would leave their lordly lands, make pilgrimage to Los Angeles, and offer up their totally not faked game trailers as sacrifice to appease the wrathful and vengeful gamers. Since its inception, E3 has been the physical manifestation of the hype culture that is central to video games. So what happens when you take the physical out of that equation? What happens when there is no show floor and all the events are just pre-recorded and uploaded to a YouTube channel in a lot of time? I'll tell you what happens. Nothing exciting. And that just about sums up E3 2021. For years now, many have wondered aloud at the relevance of E3 when so much of the work can get done the way it was done this year. But I think E3 2021 is the clearest demonstration of why E3, or at least something like it, is so important. Where was the surprise Keanu appearance? Where was the breakout debut of Ikumi Nakamura? How can we cut to a live shot of Shigeru Miyamoto emerging from a crowd when there is no crowd to emerge from? And don't tell me you didn't miss the Just Dance opening number that heralds the start of every Ubisoft press conference. No, I never bought into the line that we didn't need E3 because E3 isn't just about the games. It's about the people who make those games getting up on stage and either embarrassing themselves or winning our hearts. It's about the faces of the developers standing before you, nervous as hell, but passionately talking to you about the project that they've been sacrificing their whole life for for the past four years. The difference between you raising an eyebrow at a game versus scrolling forward on the VOD replay can often be the passion and persuasiveness of the people representing it to you. And this E3 just felt so impersonal and inhuman. I hope the physical events make their return next year, at the very least, so we can get the cringe montages that are the true highlight. In absence of people, we got games, though not quite as many as we would have liked since COVID has knocked the world on its ass and the video games industry is no exception. You get the feeling that a lot of stuff was meant to release this year and it just kind of slipped into 2022 or beyond, resulting in a set of showcases that often felt light on heavy hitters. At the very least, it was a long show and I watched every single minute of it so you didn't have to. So let's get started. Here are the biggest reveals, the biggest disappointments, the juiciest announcements, and the most overlooked gems of E3 2021. All right, so here's the first thing you have to understand about the Summer Games Festival. It's not an event that is part of E3, it's trying to replace E3. E3 is organized by the Entertainment Software Association, aka the ESA. This is an entity funded and run by big game publishers, so it's no surprise that they have lobbied extensively to protect loot boxes and commented recently that they were very pleased that few countries had enacted legislation against them. This is an entity so inept that it saw the contact details of thousands of games media and influencers leaked during a dark a breach resulting from some truly pathetic website security. This is an entity that has continued to think of E3 as a big trade show in a big trade show hall, and their only solution to getting fans more involved was selling more and more public tickets, to the point where the entire show floor is so crowded that you come out smelling like 10 other people's armpits. When the need for deeper reform became evident, you know what the ESA came up with? More celebrities at E3. Look forward to E3 2022, hosted by Trisha Paytas and Logan Paul. Enter the Dorito Pope himself, Jeff Keighley, who tried to reform E3 from the inside before piecing out in 2019 to do his own thing. Jeff's vision is a multifaceted one, where online games festivals powered by Steam allow us to play the games rather than just listen to journalists who did. No, Austin, the other Steam. Jeff has already delivered us an awards ceremony that treats the medium with the respect it deserves. Fast and the Furious Game of the Year announcement notwithstanding. And yes, part of that vision is replacing E3 with an event that feels right for the way we talk about games in 2021. As far as an opening salvo goes, the Summer Games Festival went pretty damn well. We knew a new Borderlands inspired game was on the way and we got the reveal in the form of Tiny Tina's Wonderland, a game that is Borderlands adjacent since it shares the art style and the loot and butt stallion, but it's also meant to have more RPG than ever before. Either way, the voice cast they've lined up is pretty impressive, so that'll be worth tuning in for. Metal Slug Tactics was a nice surprise. Good to know this franchise isn't going to waste, and this feels like a nice fit for it. And then it was time for a very, very special guest. Mr. Kojima, it is so good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let me ask you, as a creator, how has this past year impacted you? Tokyo, the world is a barren hellscape. Even my most pessimistic predictions of the future were not bleak enough. We spiral faster and faster into oblivion. There is nothing waiting for us at the other side. Well, I know we are all very curious about what the next era of Hideo Kojima Entertainment is going to be. Um, I, I don't know how much you can say, but can you give us any sense of, of kind of where your mind's at right now, what you're thinking about some of the themes or the ideas? 
でそこでエンターテインメントが遅れを取ってしまうとダメなんで9-11 After this uplifting interview we were treated to the reveal of the next big thing from Kojima Productions Yes, this really was a trailer hinting at a possible Metal Gear game or Metal Gear crossover, but it ended up being a Death Stranding director's cut reveal. Never mind that Hideo Kojima owned the studio that made the game he directed, so the game was already a director's cut. I still love Kojima, but he really, really makes it hard sometimes. From one celebrity to the next, we were exposed to the raw sexual energy of Jeff Goldblum as he seemed to just. Talk and improvise. I swear to God, he had no idea what he was actually revealing. He was just rolling with it, but it was totally worth it. Hello, I'm here to welcome you to a very different world. It's going to elevate you to new heights, it's going to submerge you to new depths, maybe even challenge you to control chaos. It's a world. Um, so called evolved. I featured this next game before in my put this on your radar slot, but Sable continues to look absolutely stunning and it finally got a release date of September 23rd. Very happy about that. You know what I'm not happy about though? This. This is Lost Ark, the ARPG MMORPG hybrid that has seen release in both Korea and Russia. It's done super well in those territories. Everyone loves it, and we here in the West have been begging for a localized release. Well, it's coming so long as you live in either Europe or North America. But if you live anywhere else, then bad fucking luck because it's not coming to you. African, South American, Asian, and Oceanic countries like my motherland, Australia, all miss out on this because publisher Amazon Games didn't secure the rights for a global release. I mean, Why? It's not like Jeff Bezos is strapped for cash. He could have bought the rights and I'd be playing Lost Ark's technical test right now. Is it because of my Crucible video, Jeff? Are you punishing Australia for me roasting a shitty game? Bad form, Jeff. Very disappointed. The most handsome man in Hollywood, Ryan Reynolds, showed up next to troll us about Elden Ring. I know what you're thinking, and no, I'm, I'm not here to announce I'm the star of Elden Ring. I think. Instead, no, I'm making a. I'm tired to talk about good old fashioned movies. And then he promoted a movie about a video game NPC who becomes self aware and chooses to fight back against the players who torment him. This sounds ridiculously bad, but because Ryan Reynolds is in it, it couldn't possibly suck. I mean, the man's never made a bad movie. 2D Souls like Salt and Sanctuary is getting a sequel in Salt and Sacrifice, while the visually arresting Solar Ash continues to impress despite having no firm release date. While the future of Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 is in doubt, you know what we are getting? A Vampire the Masquerade Battle Royale game. Yes, that is a thing. I am not making this up, though I, I really wish I was. Blizzard spent a few brief moments trying to convince us that Overwatch 2 is a real sequel that justifies a price tag, when it's pretty clear that every other competitive shooter would have pushed this stuff out for free over the span of months or years. I know a lot of people are hoping that Overwatch 2 reinvigorates the franchise and brings it back to center stage, but absolutely nothing Blizzard has shown has led me to believe that. From what I can tell, it's a business model problem more than anything else. The developers of Apex and Fortnite and Valorant and A whole bunch of other games have adapted to this free to play, in game events driven live service climate, while Blizzard still seems stuck back in 2015, where you'd sell map packs and people would patiently wait 14 months for the next major game update. I'm sure Overwatch 2 will be fun when it launches, I just don't know if Blizzard can keep it fun after that. With all the fall play out the way and after days of Jeff hyping up this event's conclusion, it was time for the big reveal. Without further ado, please sit back and enjoy. This truly spectacular world premiere. It is finally time. You ready to ride? Okay, no, seriously, Jeff wasn't fucking around. They will fight, and they will die. In an unending. 
years after its initial reveal, FromSoft's next epic is upon us. Elden Ring. It's basically Dark Souls 4. It's Dark Souls with a horsey. I'm kidding, FromSoft fans. Please, I'm kidding. Relax. I think if anyone knows anything about FromSoft games, it's that they live in their subtleties. We may look at this trailer and see something that looks familiar, but most of us have enough faith in Miyazaki-san to know that he isn't going to phone this one in. And hell, even if it is Dark Souls with a horse, are you going to tell me that you have a problem with that? I didn't think so. This continued for 10 minutes and was pretty much the highlight of Ubisoft's press conference. No, I'm joking. It went for like five minutes, but it was definitely up there in terms of conference highlights. The show opened with a gameplay reveal of Rainbow Six Extraction, formerly known as Quarantine, but renamed since that word took on a new sort of currency this year. The game is a three-player co-op shooter pulling in the roster of Rainbow Six Siege operators. You embark on multi-floored, multi-tiered missions where you have to complete objectives while avoiding or fighting off waves of alien enemies. I think this looks extremely boring. I was excited to hear about the existence of a co-op Rainbow Six game. I thought we'd be headed back to Ravenshield and Vegas, deep tactical shooters grounded in real-world geopolitics and espionage. Instead, what we got is essentially Tom Clancy's Left 4 Dead, and the entire thing seems to be more about its long-tail live service elements than it does its gripping campaign. You know, Yubi often gets flogged for chasing trends and lacking innovation, and I think that's true in some aspects, but I think it's a little unfair in others. I mean, they're bringing back Rocksmith, only this time you get to learn how to play an actual guitar. You can play the game on pretty much any device, and you can use your phone as a microphone, so it will tell you if you're playing the right note at the right time. That's great. I mean, what other publisher is doing stuff like this? Then there's Riders Republic. It's a continuation of Yubi's strange, inexplicable commitment to extreme sports. You can BMX, you can snowboard, wingsuit, parasail, or fly through a canyon like Buzz Lightyear. Or you can just stop for a moment and take in the view. The fact that you can do this with like 99 other riders at once is awesome. I think this looks super fun. And as with Rocksmith, no one is doing this sort of stuff. So well done, Ubisoft. A4 still has a long journey ahead. Nope. Pretty much every conference this E3 has had cutscene footage of Far Cry 6 in the mix, and this was no exception. Far Cry games live and die by the quality of their villains, and every single frame I've seen of Giancarlo Esposito makes me really excited to play Far Cry 6. The guy is just like eating up this role, and I'm genuinely keen to get captured by him over and over again so I can soak up his glorious soliloquies from the safety of my cage. I know it's cool to hate Far Cry, I get that, but like, I like Far Cry and I'm, I'm looking forward to this one. Okay, here's one that also made me really happy to see. Mario plus Rabbids was such an unexpected surprise when it debuted back in 2017 because Nintendo just don't ever license their IP out. But they trusted Ubisoft with it, and Ubisoft nailed it, delivering one of the best XCOM tactic-style games ever, while also remaining a truly, authentically Nintendo experience, with all of the charm and humor you've come to expect from the modern iterations of these characters. Like, if you haven't played this, you probably think I'm full of shit right now, but if you have played it, then you're probably nodding along. This was actually a fantastic game, and it absolutely deserved a sequel, and it's getting one, so I'm very happy. You know what else is getting a sequel? Avatar. Actually, that's a lie. It's getting four sequels, and Ubisoft is making a game for them. Here's the reveal trailer thing. I wish I could say I cared about this, but I definitely do not. I don't know a single person who wants an Avatar sequel, let alone four of them. I mean, I wish the team all the best, but like, yeah, this it's just uh, four more. Uh, wow. Okay, sure. Ubisoft showcase this year was more about what it didn't show than what it did. The Division Heartland was recently revealed and it's currently being alpha tested. So why didn't we see anything about that? Skull and Bones has been in development for like four years. Why didn't we see anything on that? Beyond Good and Evil 2 has been in development for what feels like 33 years. What the hell is going on with that game? And for the love of God, where the fuck is Splinter Cell? Why? Why? Why, Ubisoft? Are you not giving us the Splinter Cell game that we have all been begging for? Ubisoft's portfolio is a weird mix of out of left field genres and crossovers and partnerships and spin offs. Its best parts shine brightly while its worst seem bloated and over monetized and tired and bad. 
Ubisoft recently jettisoned huge chunks of their senior leadership over sexual harassment and assault allegations, and you get a sense that right now, Ubisoft is kind of rudderless, throwing stuff out to see what sticks while also doubling down on existing IP that it's not going in the right direction. I mean, it's transitioning Assassin's Creed to the first ever live service RPG, while also pivoting its business model to focus more on AAA free-to-play games. It's producing movies and TV like Assassin's Creed and Prince of Persia and The Division and Mythic Quest, but it hasn't served up an in-game narrative worth caring about in years. Right now, I don't know which direction Ubisoft is heading, and I don't think they do either. And I think this press conference made that plain as day. If there's one showcase we can rely on to tell it how it really is, it's the Devolver Showcase. Devolver likes to take things to a place that isn't even funny. So much is, is creepily possible and uncomfortably prescient. That is why monetization as a service. <clears throat> I can do so much. For years now, Devolver has held up a mirror to this industry's overhyped, over-monetized, half-finished, overly buggy, live service dependent face and said, See? Look what you have become! And we've all laughed along because we knew that it had never changed, so laughing is the only thing we could do. Devolver's shtick would ring pretty hollow if they didn't have a great library of reasonably priced games to back it up, but they always come prepared. Shadow Warrior 3 is looking like the game Rage 2 tried to be, and by that I mean fun. The newly revealed Trek to Yumi looks like Akira Kurosawa the video game, and I'm so absolutely playing the shit out of that as soon as it releases. Wizard with a Gun seems to be some sort of Final Fantasy IX spin-off, where Vivi's race moved to Texas and took up. Death's Door has some very clean looking aesthetics and some lovely combat animations, while Tumble Time may or may not be a real video game. We simply aren't sure at this point. As much as I enjoyed the showcase, I kept thinking about the recent rumors that Devolver was considering going public, with numbers as large as $1.4 billion being thrown around. That's money that's hard to resist, and these press conferences are going to be a hell of a time capsule if that ever happens. Let's hope it doesn't. As soon as I saw the like ratio on this bad boy, I knew we'd be in for a treat. Gearbox held their first ever digital showcase at this year's E3, and it didn't go so well because Randy Pitchford was in it. The show was basically him walking around the set of the upcoming Borderlands movie, harassing famous people. You could tell how pissed off and bored everyone was by him. I mean, look at Eli Roth during this bit here. So for Borderlands fans who uh, play the video game, if you have people in your lives that, have, that you want to introduce to Borderlands but aren't going to play the game with you, this movie's how you do it. You can bring your, your family, your loved ones, bring them to the movie. Later on, Eli just walks off mid-conversation. I mean, who could blame him? It was so annoying listening to Randy talk because he would ask people these questions then he would just talk over them and like, no one cared what he had to say. It was just, it was so annoying. Oh, at least we got a good meme template out of it. To be honest, we were all tuning in for a more detailed look at Tiny Tina's Wonderland, but those hopes were quickly shattered when they were like, nope, nothing new on that today. Thanks, I guess. To make us feel better, they rolled this joke reel. Knock knock, who is there? The commando. The commando who? I don't know, what are you axing me for? Welcome to the Homeworld Diner. Our special today is the dessert of carrot. Help, I've got fallen and I can't get up. I'm very certain that these jokes were written by the same people who wrote Borderlands 3. There was one ray of sunshine in this absolute shit show. Tribes of Midgard is an upcoming co-op ARPG set in the old Viking world. It's published by Gearbox, not made by them, but they've also published Risk of Rain 2, and that game was amazing, so hopefully this is good as well. You know what else Gearbox have published though? This piece of shit. Our duty is to carry the burden of war. Or just save the victory. Godfall was the worst looter I'd ever played at launch, and what's funny is that the developers insisted that the game would be impossible to port to other platforms because it required the power of the PS5. Well, guess what? Money talks and bullshit walks. It's coming to PS4 in a few weeks' time. Now, PS4 owners can avoid playing Godfall the same way that PS5 owners do. To add to the hilarity of all this, the developers announced that they were beta testing matchmaking soon. Like six months after their co-op looter launches and they're gonna start beta testing matchmaking. At least we had the right meme template to respond to this news. TLDR on the Gearbox Showcase. It should have stayed lost on that USB stick in medieval times. This year, Microsoft purchased Bethesda for a cool $7.5 billion, and the internet entered a deep state of denial as it tried to convince itself that Bethesda's flagship titles would also somehow appear on PlayStation. Inevitably, the seven stages of grief all lead to one place, acceptance. 
and Todd was only too keen to usher us there when he opened up the Xbox showcase with a first look at Starfield, confirming once and for all that the game would be an Xbox and PC exclusive. The look at Starfield was only a brief in-engine cinematic, but it was more than enough to get everyone giddy with excitement, highlighting just how much brand cash Bethesda still has, despite one of the most catastrophic game launches in history. Wolfenstein Youngblood. Oh yeah, and also Fallout 76. This was meant to be the wedding party to celebrate Microsoft and Bethesda's recent nuptials, but as big as that news was, it wasn't the defining narrative of Microsoft's E3 presence. This didn't feel like a wedding, it felt like a debutante ball, and the Microsoft we saw before us was fresh-faced, invigorated, and ready to be ogled and objectified by men ages 16 to 39. Microsoft's first party lineup was vast. We saw Stalker 2, which was an actual video game that we will most likely be able to play someday. If you had asked me about a month ago whether this game was ever going to release, I'd have bet my life savings that it wouldn't, but there it was, right there, and it looks pretty damn good. We got an update on Psychonauts 2, another game I never thought we'd see, made possible thanks to Microsoft's investment. Grounded is alive and well and getting updates, Age of Empires 4 is on the way, and Obsidian served up the best trailer of E3 with the reveal of Outer Worlds 2. Suddenly, and for no reason, people running. These pointless slow motion shots make everything seem cool and should bolster pre-sale numbers. That wah sound can mean only one thing. We must gaze over an epic shot of a world. And there should be lens flares. We saw Forza Horizon 5, which looks scarily good, and if I were Polyphony Digital, makers of Gran Turismo, I would absolutely be shitting myself at this point. And then of course the man himself made his appearance, the Master Chief, meeting a new AI companion who, unlike Cortana, is wearing clothes. I'm not sure why that change happened. Did the cyber snake hand the AI mainframe a forbidden fruit? They all suddenly discover their shame? Anyway, we didn't see any of the new single player stuff since the focus was squarely on the free to play, 120 FPS enabled multiplayer that's gonna ship the same day as Halo Infinite's campaign. It looked really fun. There were a ton of ideas and moments in there that got me legitimately hopeful that Halo would have its long awaited return to glory. And honestly, few things would make me happier than to see that. Having said that, I'm keeping my hype in check because I think that the biggest enemy that 343 has right now are the crushing expectations of fans. I'm not expecting Halo Infinite to make me feel the same way Halo 1 or 2 did. I'm just hoping for a good, fun Halo game. If 343 achieves that, then I think it'll be a job well done. Outside of its first party lineup, Microsoft reminded us that the Xbox has plenty of third party titles as well. We got our first look at Battlefield 2042 and holy shit! That looks awesome. I'm a casual Battlefield fan, I dip my toe in for every release and maybe the odd update, but I'm seriously looking forward to October 22nd at this point, because this shit looks absolutely wild in the best possible way. The whole marketing approach this time around is such a stark contrast to the disastrous rollout of Battlefield 5, and as the result, the hype is so thick you could eat it with a spoon. We learned that Diablo 2 Resurrected will be releasing on all platforms September 23rd. It looks so nice. I just loved watching this trailer. Vicarious Visions are absolute geniuses and Blizzard are very lucky to have them. I was very stoked to learn that we're getting a Plague Tale sequel because the first game was superb. And I'll admit, I was more than a little impressed with this Shredder snowboarding game. It just looked really smooth, it reminded me of 1080 snowboarding back in the day. Xbox also had plenty of indies to show off. If 12 minutes isn't on your radar yet, then it sure as shit should be. Somerville is a new game from the co-founder of Play Dead, who earlier made both Inside and Limbo, so it's no surprise that Somerville looks as good as it does. I think the standout for the entire Xbox showcase, though, was this. Years ago, a game called The Last Night was revealed, but then disappeared into development hell. Replaced seems to be picking up where The Last Night left off, serving up a visual star that is so stunning that I cannot get these images out of my head. Just incredible stuff that reminds you how talented the people making video games are, and how lucky we are to play the games that they make for us. Xbox showed 30 games this showcase. 27 of those games will be making their way to Game Pass, and every single first party Microsoft game will appear on Game Pass on day one. And that isn't even Microsoft's final form. I mean, Elder Scrolls 6, Avowed, the next Gears game, the next big thing from Rare, Redfall from Arcane, the next id game, whatever the hell that ends up being. Xbox lost last generation. They lost big. They lost so big that it has taken Phil Spencer years of planning and work and investment to right the ship. This year's E3 showcase felt like Microsoft at the end of a training montage in a Rocky movie. Lean, ripped, and hungry. 
You can feel Microsoft's hunger this generation. They're coming out of their corner swinging, and as gamers we all benefit when the platforms we're relying on are in fighting form. Ding ding ladies and gentlemen, ding ding. Next up was the Marvel show, I mean the Square Enix Showcase, proudly brought to you by Chaos. The event started with a very, very, very long look at the Guardians of the Galaxy, yet another Square Enix Marvel game that forgoes any connection to the cinematic universe, serving up their own unique spin on the characters and story instead. Unlike the dollar store Avengers that Square served up earlier, these Guardians actually look pretty good, and the in-game soundtrack that I can't share with you without being copy struck was pitch perfect. When it comes to characters, visuals, presentation and tone, I really like the look of this. Having said that, it is being made by Eidos Montreal, who were also pulled in to help out on Marvel's Avengers. This is a studio that made the timeless Deus Ex Mankind Divided and the brilliant but half-finished Deus Ex Human Revolution. This is a studio that served up some of the best immersive sim emergent gameplay of the last decade, now put to work on a licensed Marvel beat-em-up. I'm sorry, but that combat just didn't look any good, and the fact that you can only play as Star-Lord and just command the other Guardians feels like a really, really bad call. I do appreciate that Guardians is a complete, microtransaction-free, non-live service experience. Clearly Square Enix learned at least something from the Avengers disaster, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little disappointed to learn that Eidos are working on this, when their studio could be working on the next Deus Ex game, or something that plays a little closer to their strengths. After like a 20 minute reveal of a new Marvel IP, we got a 20 second reveal of a 2D remaster for Final Fantasy 1 through 6. That's roughly 3 seconds per Final Fantasy game compared to 1,200 seconds for one Marvel game. And to top it all off, the end of the trailer revealed that these remasters were only coming to PC and mobile. Why would you not release these on console? Do you think the PS5 can't handle these graphics? This makes absolutely no sense. We got an update on Platinum's next big title, Babylon's Fall, and I don't know what happened to this one. When it was revealed two years ago, it was a single player looking character action game. Uh, it looked cool. Now it seems like the visuals have been downgraded and it's a co-op live service game. Maybe I spoke too soon when I said that Square had learned its lesson from Marvel's Avengers. The highlight of the showcase was the reveal of the already leaked Final Fantasy Souls-like developed by Team Ninja. Having seen it, I think it looks cool. I'm just not quite clear exactly what it's about or what the main character is trying to do. I'm here to kill Chaos. Looks like Chaos has been waiting for us. I want to kill. Chaos. This is the Shrine of Chaos. We're here to kill Chaos. There were a lot of memes created on the back of this reveal, including a mock-up of the key art to roast the fact that this game has a lot of PS2 energy, and not necessarily in a good way. There was a demo mode available as soon as this conference was over, and it was corrupt, so no one could play it. When it was playable, many found it to be a very competent Neo 2 reskin, but the tone of it was wholly removed from Final Fantasy. Its dark edgelord narrative and composition holding none of the charm that Cloud or Squall or Noctis did. The Warrior of Light looks like some angry football fan you'd meet at a Manchester pub who just as soon as glass you as look at you. You know, I know Square and Team Ninja are going for a different tone here, but it really feels like this ain't it. I don't think anyone would disagree with me when I say that Square Enix Showcase really sucked. It leaned into a bunch of stuff we didn't care about, glossed over the stuff we did, and the bigger reveals range from being interesting to downright terrible. Having said all that, I think it's important to remember that Square has a lot of other stuff in the works that they didn't show here. Final Fantasy VII Remake Episode Yuffie was just released, and it's great, and the next major chapter in the Final Fantasy VII Remake saga is in development. Final Fantasy XVI is looking awesome, and it's on the way, eventually. Final Fantasy XIV Endwalker's expansion releases at the end of the year, and it's sure to be great, because that game forgot how to suck a long time ago. Then there's Dragon Quest, and whatever Crystal Dynamics are working on, and please, please, please let it be a Soul Reaver sequel, my god! Point is, Square is a hell of a lot bigger and better than what they showcased at this press conference. And thank God for that, because this press conference... Uh, not good, not good. The PC Game Show. So let's talk about the good first. I feel like the PC Game Show is a real passion project in many aspects. They really put a lot of work into the presentation. I think Day9 in particular puts it all on the line with his hosting. It's a 90 minute PC gaming extravaganza that does a really good job of highlighting a lot of titles that wouldn't get surfaced in other shows. I mean, this is where we saw They Always Run, which is a great looking 2D side scroller that I've covered on this show in the past. This is where we saw Gigabash, a kaiju brawler that I truly hope gets an Attack on Titan game mode. 
We saw Lemnus Gate, which is a soon to be released and very promising turn based first person shooter hybrid. Yes, that is a thing. Look it up. Far Changing Tides was revealed and it looks as stunning as its predecessor. Silt looked absolutely spectacular. It looked like a mix of gris and inside. Songs of Conquest took me by surprise since I loved Heroes of Might and Magic and this looks like a great spiritual successor. And Project Warlock 2 has gone straight onto my wish list because I love me a good boomer shooter, especially one that looks this rad. The PC Game Show is the only place we got to see this sort of stuff and it's fantastic that this space exists to provide that. But my god, this show is absolutely unwatchable. It is so stuffed with ads that it feels like they made an entire showcase based on the concept of pop-up ads. Every three to five minutes was some sort of commercial for something, generally a promo for a custom-built Mech Warrior PC that nobody cared about, but culminating in this actual product that you could purchase for actual money if you are dumb enough. The Impulse is a neurocontroller that aims to make you a better gamer by cutting out response times almost entirely. The glove measures the signal traveling through muscles in your your hand. In theory, it's given you the chance to nail that headshot precious milliseconds ahead of your opponent. For years, everyone has been yelling at the PC Games Showcase to radically strip out all of its filler and deliver a tight 45 minutes of great reveals. And yet every year we get 90 minute showcases that feels like 120 minutes of ads. I want to love this showcase, I really do, but it desperately needs to change. There were a bunch of other showcases as well, but I feel like giving them each their own slot would be overkill, so let's canter through them, shall we? The Future Game Show was a brief but enjoyable affair that highlighted a number of games we'd already seen before, but also revealed some absolute gems like the stop-motion claymation-inspired Harold Halibut. Every character and environment in the game was first handmade in the real world, scanned into the game and animated using motion capture. The result is one of the most unique video game art styles I've ever seen, and I'm very much down for it. Oli Oli World got its moment in the sun, its new art direction soundtrack and gameplay positively beaming. It's great to see skate games get such a big resurgence lately, and this one is looking particularly special. Also, we saw not one, but two games devoted to the subject of sorting and delivering mail. Lake and Kiwi. I thought the premise sounded dumb, but then I remembered that Death Stranding was on my Game of the Year list, and that game was essentially just about delivering parcels, so I quickly became aware of just how under Kojima's spell I really am. Capcom had a showcase. Here's a look at all the new stuff they revealed. Two K had a showcase. It was literally a Zoom meeting with people talking about social justice, diversity, and inclusion. Now, these are all good things, don't get me wrong. I think it's great that a company that crams gambling into all of their games is so progressive, I really do. But you really have to wonder if there wouldn't have been a better time and format to host this discussion. When you hold some of the biggest, most sought after IP in all of video games and you host a keynote, gamers have certain expectations. I think it's pretty clear from this like ratio that those expectations were not met. Speaking of unmet expectations, Bandai Namco held a showcase as well. People piled in very excited and hopeful that they might get a deeper look at Elden Ring. Instead, the entire keynote was a look at the upcoming Dark Pictures anthology House of Ashes, which looks cool by the way, but that's not why people were there. Again, people were not pleased. With a bumpy and uneven E3 behind us, it fell to Nintendo on the final day of the show to deliver the knockout punch to save not just E3, but gaming as a whole. Did they do it? Well, I don't know about that, but it, it was a pretty good direct. It started a little early with a tweet from Nintendo Japan, politely asking anyone who wants to live stream the direct to kindly fuck off. Nintendo basically said, please don't live stream our live stream. And that was it. In response, Twitch refused to broadcast the event on their platform since none of their creators could do so. So about half a million people piled into the official YouTube stream, just as Nintendo's analytics department wanted us to. I'm sure that number will look great on the next financial earnings call, and all it cost was the engagement and free advertising that comes with thousands of influencers live streaming and reacting to your commercials. Good call, Nintendo. Anyway, the Direct kicked off with a reveal of Tekken star Kazuya making his way into Smash, casting his foes into a volcano like Frodo but without the hesitation. Not gonna lie, the Kirby gag at the end got me good. We learned that both Life is Strange and Guardians of the Galaxy would be making their way to Switch utilizing cloud streaming tech, a technology we're going to see a lot more of as we get deeper into this console generation and the Switch struggles to keep up. There was a Super Monkey Ball game, a Mario Party game, and then we got pretty much the best reveal of the entire Direct.
This is Metroid Dread. It's the first 2D Metroid game in 19 years. It takes the modern day formula, zhuzhes it up with some modern day graphics and adds a splash of alien isolation or Resident Evil Nemesis, since Samus is being pursued by this general grievous looking robot. There's nothing about this package that I don't love and while it would have been nice to see Metroid Prime 4, I'll settle for this for now. Two classic franchises came back from the dead, WarioWare Get It Together returns to serve up some micro game fun, only this time it's co-op and Advanced Wars is coming back. And if you've played Advanced Wars back in the day, you'd know that this game absolutely rocks. This is a full remake with completely new visuals, definitely looking forward to this one. Shin Megami Tensei 5 was also shown off, but we already knew about this one since it was leaked early. Still, it looked good. And then of course, it was time for the grand finale. Here's a little something you might like. This is a Game & Watch system that lets you play three games in the Legend of Zelda series. And that was the end of the Nintendo Showcase. Nothing else, nothing else shown. It was just, that was it. It was, that was, all right, there was one more thing. There's always one more thing. Breath of the Wild 2 doesn't have a name yet, but it does have a release window, 2022. But people are already calling bullshit on that one, expecting it to slide into 2023. Given that the game has already been in development for a long ass time, and it's using an existing game engine, and it's using a lot of existing assets, I think people were expecting a little more from this reveal today. Truth is, I have no perspective or take on what I saw. It was all so brief that I couldn't form an opinion on any part of it. Will it be good? Sure, probably, but I'm kind of putting it out of my mind until we see a lot more of it. Anyway, that was, uh, that was E3 2021? E3 2021. At the end of every E3, I like to think about what this show says about where the industry is and where it's headed. I mean, you could read the tea leaves years ago and see every publisher announcing a looter shooter. You saw that morph later on into a fixation with live services. We've seen publishers abandon single player games only to recently reaffirm their commitment to them. And the new technology that washes through each year continues to expand the ways we play in subtle but important ways. What then can we say about this E3? What did it say about video games in 2021 and beyond? For me, the central narrative of this show is that the video games industry, like the rest of the world, is still reeling from the sucker punch that was COVID-19. We're at the start of a new console generation, and yet no one can get their hands on consoles. The games we look toward to push the frontiers of technology and innovation are both delayed and held back at least in some small part by the need to port them to previous gen consoles. That's fine by the way, I understand that, but it definitely means that when Gran Turismo 7 or God of War Ragnarok do arrive, they won't be utilizing every inch of Sony's next gen hardware because they simply were not allowed to be built that way. Right now it feels like the gaming industry is wrapping up the last generation more than it's delivering on the promise of the next generation. That's the kind of sentiment I would have expected to see at last year's E3, where the final bunch of console exclusives would serve as a sort of swan song for both the PS4 and the Xbox One, but owing to COVID, it feels like a much longer kiss goodbye than any of us would have anticipated. I'll put it more starkly, I don't think we saw a single game that we looked at and thought, shit dude, there is no way that would be possible on last gen hardware. Even stuff like Forza Horizon 5 and Stalker, which are next gen exclusives, they looked impressive, don't get me wrong, but they didn't really like have that kind of fully, holy shit next gen feel that you kind of, you know, send your friends screenshots of and all that sort of stuff. The industry is in a holding pattern right now, and it will eventually re-emerge from it, but it's going to take longer than we thought. The good news is that 2022 has so much in store for us, from God of War to Starfield to Breath of the Wild 2 and tons more, but it's really the years beyond that that I'm most excited for because it's at that point when developers can cast off the constraints of this old hardware and shoot the moon. I think E3 2022 is going to be one hell of a show, which is great because this one sure as hell wasn't. Guys, thanks very much for watching the video. E3 is a special time of year and I appreciate you sharing it with me. I want to offer a special shout out to my editor, Austin, who worked super hard to bring this video to you today since we had a ton of material to crunch through to get this video together. If you enjoyed yourself, please do drop the video a like and hit the subscribe button. This Week in Video Games will return next week at the usual time slot, so hit the notification bell so you won't miss it. Thank you once again and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. 
Thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down so I know to do better for next time. If you enjoyed yourself, consider subscribing. And if you really enjoyed yourself, maybe consider hitting that notification bell so you never miss a video. You can see my patrons here on the left. They're awesome. They're amazing. If you want to join them, check out my Patreon page. Thank you again. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.